memo to the New York Times libel merchants. United States military is not the Ku Klux Klan. I shouldn't have to say this stuff, but I do. Hey, everybody, I'm Steve Green with Bill Whittle and Scott Ott, and this is Right Angle, brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. Gentlemen, the editors in a otherwise unsigned 2,000-word editorial chose Memorial Day weekend to equate the United States military with white supremacy and what they called the Ku Klux Klan's blood-drenched tradition of racial terrorism. Uh, the crux of their argument, and I think this thing was 2,000 words long to hide the fact, you know, a lot of smoke and mirrors to hide the fact that their entire argument is extremely weak sauce. You see, the military has uh, military bases that are named after Confederate generals and officers and whatnot. And while I don't think we should do that, generally don't honor rebels, those bases were named after, or excuse me, were named by powerful Democratic committee chairman back in the bad old days of the Democratic Solid South. And it shouldn't have to be mentioned that the Ku Klux Klan was originally uh, the Democrats' shock troops to keep blacks in line. Bill, can you guess what word was missing from the New York Times editorial? 2,000 words. And this one word wasn't mentioned even one time. Can you guess what it is? No, you got me on this one. Democrat. <laughs> oh, well, ah. there you go. Yeah. Uh, I don't disapprove of this article because of um, the hypocrisy of Democrats calling out other um, members of the military uh, to make up for the sins of their own past. I have a serious article uh, problem with this article because of the entire idea of of somehow deciding what the sins of the past are and not letting that be decided by the people who were actually there, who made the actual decisions at the actual time. It's interesting that the New York Times didn't mention anything about Walter Durante, who knew that millions of people were starving to death in the Soviet Union and continued to issue glowing reports for which he won a Pulitzer Prize and for which the New York Times has still uh, not returned. So we're just going to assume that they're okay with that. Um, Needless to say, the outrage and the uh, anger and the hypocrisy uh, actually lessens for me, uh, Steve, uh, as the as the shreds of what was once the New York Times flutter in in the radioactive breeze that they've created for themselves. I used to think this would have bothered me a lot more if it had been a reputable um, hmm. newspaper. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, their argument is, uh, let's just take Fort Lee or Fort Hood, uh, either one of which sure. would be a fine example. Uh, if you're willing to buy the argument that uh, it's a white supremacist notion to honor Robert E. Lee uh, because he fought for the Confederacy and the Confederacy was about states' rights and the states' rights in question were the rights to hold slaves. It's just pretty simple, really. Yeah. Then... Obviously, if you go for this, then um, then Washington, D.C. is due for a renaming anytime soon. I'm sure Obamaville will be promoted or <laughs> or, or any of the other things that happen to be there. Obamaville. This Kinda arrogance. Like Hooverville. The, yeah. <laughs> this arrogance, the arrogance of people sitting in judgment of the past is what happens in – in declining civilizations, and it what happen, and it's also what happens in civilizations with no real threats, because of the effectiveness of the military that they've just smeared. The New York Times has the luxury of writing articles like this instead of articles about whether or not we're going to survive the next biological attack or or the next terrorist attack or whatever else the the military has defended us from so effectively that the Times has time to spend on on trivial nonsense like this. But but back to the issue about about judging uh, people in the past. Uh, Fort Lee was named after Robert E. Lee. Fort Hood was named after John Bell Hood. Uh, and, and on and on we go. Uh, these men were distinguished military tacticians. That's why military bases were named after them. Robert E. Lee was an enormously brilliant strategist. John Bell Hood led, uh, was not a strategist, but led his, led his Texas Corps with, with distinction and honor and, and courage. Uh, to say that these people are traitors is technically true, but it's also technically true to say that they all were pardoned and they all came back into the, uh, 
into the Union and continued to live their lives. Uh, Nathan Bedford Ford, I might point out, did not. Uh, however, all of this to say that I certainly hope that history judges these people by name for their atrocities like, oh, I don't know, keeping pets maybe or um, or having uh, uh, having ridden in a, an automobile that consumes uh, carbon fuels uh, despite the fact that they knew better. In fact, that's a perfect argument. Why don't we just go with that one? Um, the people who write for the New York Times are saying that they're white supremacists and they should give up uh, naming bases after traitors because it supports white supremacy. These are the same people that are telling us that uh, that carbon emissions are killing the planet, not just killing black people, killing everybody. And yet they go to work in Uber or on taxis or they go on subways, which generate electricity off of coal or, or oil or so on. They do this because it's convenient for them to do this. They don't make a stand against it. They don't ride the bikes to school or to work. School is pretty much the same thing. They don't have candles and they don't use typewriters. They use electricity that they know, according to them, I don't buy into this, but they know is killing the planet. And they do it on a daily basis. So the hypocrisy of this is beyond my ability to measure. But again, I think my most, my most distinct feeling is how little I care about what the goddamn New York Times has to say about anything. <laughs> well said. Uh, you know, the United States military was, uh, thanks to President Truman, who was something of a racist on a personal level, which is unfortunately very common back then. But when it came to the military, he did the exact right thing when he ordered it to become integrated. And for all of its full faults and flaws as a human institution, our military integrated faster and more successfully than possibly any other institution in this country that had previously been segregated. It was something of a miracle, and it still is to this day. And Scott, this is what gets me. For generations now, especially since we switched to an all volunteer force in the 1970s, the United States military has provided training education, good pay, and chances for career advancement and life advancement, real personal advancement that uh, otherwise wasn't open to a lot of black Americans. So is, is it fair of me to question the New York Times and its motives in tearing down one of the most successfully integrated institutes in the United States? Yeah, the, Steve, you're saying exactly what I thought when I first heard this. I thought, well, you, if you want to target somebody for racism or white supremacist leanings, the last place in America you'd want to look is the U.S. military. As you pointed out, Correct. they were among the earliest institutions uh, in or out of government to, to begin the process of integration of black troops and others into their forces. Um, you know, if you want to be a white supremacist in, the, uh, supremacist in this country, the last thing you want to do is to join the military <laughs> of this country. You're going to be going in with one of the most diverse workforces of any place in the country. So yeah. it just it just really doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. You know, there's a there's an old story about when uh, shortly after the surrender of the Confederacy to the Union forces at Appomattox, uh, there was a celebration in Washington D.C. and President Lincoln was beckoned to come out and make some remarks, and he did, and uh, the uh, to to adoring crowds who were cheering his name. And um, at one point, and I pulled up the quote of this, he says. Uh, I propose closing up this interview by the band performing a particular tune, which I will name. Before this is done, however, I wish to mention one or two little circumstances connected with it. I've always thought that Dixie, one of the best tunes I've ever heard. Our adversaries over the way attempted to appropriate it, but I insisted yesterday that we fairly captured it. And then the crowd cheered. I presented the question to the attorney general, and he gave it as his legal opinion that it is our lawful prize. At this point, there's laughter and applause. And he said, I now request the band to favor me with its performance. 
And now he was making light of the circumstances there, but Abraham Lincoln had that band play Dixie for a very intentional purpose. And You're that is right. because the entire objective was not to crush the South, but to reunite the country. The reason why we were the Union is because we were in favor of unification of the country. And that means that uh, showing respect to your worthy adversaries is part of the process of victory. That doesn't mean you should excuse their sins, but then again, I am so grateful my sins have been excused by a much higher power than President Lincoln. So we <laughs> right. all we all have enough uh, 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 piled up on that account uh, to be a little bit more humble when it comes to evaluating others. And uh, I think that the United States government uh, rightly appropriated the names of General Lee and others and can use them any way she pleases. And I think in many ways, it's part of the ongoing process of healing this country. I look forward to seeing more um, ships and uh, bases and other things that are named after great warriors from minority races as well. Um, I think we can do more in that regard. All and that. I don't think that the Army or the Navy or the Air Force or the Marines or the Coast Guard or the Merchant Marine would have any objection to doing that. Indeed. Steve, I just yeah, I just got to add one thing. It's just just a, a picture because Scott got it exactly right. The first time in American history that you could have a black man telling thousands, tens of thousands of white people what to do and making them do it yep. was when was when black officers reached that reached command rank and flag rank and a, and a black general could come out and give an order to to twenty thousand, fifty thousand white Americans and they would have to obey it. Not only would yes, they have to sir. obey it, they signed on the dotted line in order so they could obey it. That's a lot of nerve. I'd like to see the color of the of the New York Times editorial board that wrote that article. I got a funny feeling I could predict exactly how that how that editorial board looks. And you know, I love learning stuff from these two guys, because after what Bill said and what Scott followed up with, I'm going to totally withdraw my objection to having a base named after Lee and a base named after Hood. It's all good. Let's do what Scott said, too. Let me go off on uh, on one brief tangent here, something I've been wanting to say for a long time, I think the great irony of the result of the Civil War, and especially over the last uh, 50 years post Jim Crow, uh, post segregation, is that if you look at the southern states, lower taxes, more freedoms, better business climates, they're a lot more like the America that was than the northern states, and particularly the western states that won the Civil War. So thank you, and ongoing thanks to the folks in the South for continuing to remind us what this country can and should be. Uh, that said, I think what the New York Times did this weekend, number one, it was Awful. I don't think I need to say that. Its timing was just exquisitely awful. It was just salt in the wound. But I think this is part two of their 1619 project, which, if you'll recall, was mm. to claim that the founding of America was when the first slave was imported to these shores by the British. It's just not true for various reasons. The scholarship is shoddy. The premise is absolute crap and all the rest. But I'll tell you what. As we get closer and closer to this election just six months from now, there's going to be a part three. There's going to be a part four, five, six, however many they can squeeze in to try and just whip racial tensions in this country up to an absolute frenzy to help remove Donald Trump from office. I'm damn sure that's what's going on here. Don't you let him get away with it. That's your right angle on that. Brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. Remember, content like this. Need sponsors like you, so please click on over to BillWhittle.com, become a member. We would love to have you on board. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.